official time for the class here. Um, the main place to go to view these lectures is Twitch, which I'll put in the Zoom chat. You can use Zoom, but you won't see the visual unless you go to Twitch. So um, the main place to go is Twitch. This Zoom I use only really for student questions. And, and so you can share your screen if you're having trouble with projects, which may come up later. And so here we are. This is cryptography. Cryptography and cryptocurrencies. All the information you need for all the projects and everything is on my website, samsclass.info. There is also a canvas uh, that comes through City College, and there will be one next week for the non-City College people too. Um, and that's where you can uh, turn in your homework and post discussions and such. But all the actual projects are here on my page at samsclass.info at CNET 141. And so um, you can get, now these are free books about Bitcoin and Ethereum. And this is the main textbook for the class, Serious Cryptography. And you can get it free from uh, Safari Online with instructions here if you're a City College student. If not, you have to pay 34 bucks to find some other way to get it. And uh, anyway, so this class is a little bit schizophrenic because the original thing I did was teach just normal cryptography, AES and RSA and stuff. But then cryptocurrencies came out and uh, they became important and they keep on becoming more and more important. So I decided to add a lot of cryptocurrency projects to the class. And so um, if you look at the schedule, I've had projects do C101, C102, C103, and 105. And those projects are mainly the ones that teach you ordinary cryptography. And if you do those, I think those are the most valuable because as you will discover if you don't already know, I think cryptocurrency is complete garbage. I used to work uh, under contract of the Federal Trade Commission when they were punishing pyramid schemes, and that's all it is. I also used to work in finance as a database analyst, and um, it's, it's just appalling. Cryptocurrencies have no reason to exist. They're just nothing there but crime and pyramid schemes. People that invest in them keep getting ripped off, which I'll talk about. So I highly recommend not investing in cryptocurrencies, and I think they should not exist. But my opinion doesn't matter that much, and cryptocurrency is here to stay. It's huge. You can make your own cryptocurrency as a project, and you will. That's why I'm saying if you want to... Now, I rec highly recommend uh, learning about cryptocurrency and perhaps getting a job doing things like programming it and securing it. Just don't throw your money in there. This is like being the guy that sells shovels to gold miners. Those guys go off and freeze to death and die digging for stuff they aren't going to find. But you could be the guy selling them shovels, which is an honest job. Anyway, so um, if you want to focus on cryptocurrency, you'll find the projects here at this projects link. And you'll see there's a bunch of cryptocurrency projects, which I'll talk about. And you don't have to do my required projects. You can just do other ones. They're worth extra credit. A lot of them. So here you, here you, um, you do make a, a coin here. You make your own currency with solidity. And uh, in, on, make your own Ethereum smart coin. And then you hack some, uh, you'll hack, you do a reentry attack, a logic attack, and exploit a fallback function. You do a 51% attack down here. Um, we'll do a few of the famous attacks, and you'll see. So anyway, if you want to, you can focus on blockchains and cryptocurrency and do these projects. If you don't want to do that, you can do what, I, what most students do and what I've always done, which is just focus on ordinary cryptography down here, and you do things like binary, binary, the Caesar cipher, the row method. Then there's this great thing called CryptoHack, which is a wonderful series of projects teaching you everything about all the modern cryptography. We'll do AES, RSA, ECC with sodium, and various attacks like homomorphic encryption, quantum encryption, uh, various at hashing attacks. So, you know, all these things are, um, are that's the standard cryptography. Hey, if somebody has 40 Bitcoins, hey, that's pretty good. 40 Bitcoins is a pretty good chunk of change, I guess. Anyway, um, do lectures happen to be recorded? Yes, absolutely. And I'm glad you asked these questions. The lectures will all be recorded and they'll appear right here on this page. They're all recorded and put on YouTube. And um, right here, this schedule doesn't have them, but at the end of this nice lecture, I'll add them right here. And all my old lectures are up to, if you wanted to see a topic that is coming later, you could go to old classes at samsclass.info and then go down to 141, which I think I taught about a year ago. Yeah, I taught it in fall of 2020, and all the lectures from this year are up. So this is where the lectures are going to be. They're all on YouTube, and they appear here. And I'll be filling them in as we go for this semester. So you can see the stuff that's a year old here covering all the topics. Yep, very good question. 
I'm glad you bring it up. And of course, everybody's welcome, whether you're enrolled at City College or not. If you're enrolled at City College, you will get official college credit for this course. If not, then you're still welcome to participate and I'll give you a grade, but it won't be an official college grade. Anyway, so let's see, anything else I need to warn you about? Oh, how the grading works. Uh, there's a document someplace. There, the grading policy. Uh, attendance does not matter. You're welcome to attend or not to attend. It does not affect your grade. What matters is quizzes and projects and the final exam. Um, there's a bunch of quizzes. They're in Canvas. They're multiple choice and um, open book and all that. And you get two tries. There's a whole bunch of projects adding up to most of the course, 345 points, which are hands-on projects where you set up something with cryptography or cryptocurrencies, and then you turn in some screenshots finding flags to prove that you've done it. And then there's a final exam. You get extra credit by doing extra projects on my page or by doing other things like going to conferences, training events, uh, participating in competitions. Some students in another class wanted to do some of the uh, online competitions. I forget the name of some of them. But anyway, anything, anything educational like that is all worth extra credit. Just let me know. Things like RSA, Black Hat, DEF CON, all that jazz, uh, B-sides, any kind of even like a, a, tr a meetup training class. And also Pacific Hackers has a free monthly meetup, which is online, and I highly recommend that. It's the San, uh, San, uh, Sunnyvale-based uh, hacking group, and they do a lot of good stuff. So let me know if you're doing anything else. It's worth extra credit, and then you just get a grade based on the points. Attendance doesn't help or hurt you specifically. And if you don't want to attend live, you don't have to. You can just view the video later. Or you can just skip them both and read the book or find some other way to learn it. All that matters is do you learn it enough to pass the quiz or do some hands-on until you've done enough work to add up to enough total points. All right. So I think that's it for the mechanics. Uh, if anybody wants to add, I'll approve you. Uh, I, add, I drew two people right before class, and I'll check later. If anybody wants to add, just request an add in the City College on Web4, and I can approve them right away. How do the quizzes work? Uh, they're just five questions, multiple choice, in Canvas. And then um, and you get two tries. You have 10 minutes to answer five questions, and then you can try again. That's all. Yeah, anybody, anybody can join from anywhere. If you live in a foreign country, um, you would have difficulty actually taking the class officially. You'd have to pay a high fee and stuff. But if you want to just tune in and participate, I'll have a, a special a clone of the Canvas server off the college network ready by next week. So you can do everything and earn points and everything, get a grade if you like. Um, but uh, you won't have any official college credit unless you actually sign up with the college and pay the fee and all that which you can do if you like, but if you don't care, I don't care. Um, all right, good. I'm looking for any other questions. Uh, yeah, yeah, if you show up on time, then you can get an answer right away. Otherwise, oh yeah, how to contact me. Um, you can send messages inside Canvas, that's fine. There's also an email address to use if you want to, which is here, cnit.141 at gmail. Um, I have a personal email address, but I often miss emails there. Everything gets buried under spam. If you send to this address, it will go to my highly competent grader who will make sure it gets proper attention. Um, also, Twitter. You should all be on Twitter if you're in information security, which I guess in this class some people might not be. They might actually be more interested in banking or something. But if you want to be a security professional, you should be on Twitter. It is the network where most security networking happens, and I've, I'm on Twitter at Sam Bound. You can reach me there. That's the fastest way to reach me. Tweets reach me faster than anything because Twitter is not buried under spam. Email is buried under spam. But Twitter is effective to reach me. But for anything related to the class, the best thing is send it here so my grader will see it and she will make sure that everybody gets properly graded and credited with their points. And if anything goes wrong, as it often does, let me know if you can't reach the lecture or if you get the wrong score on something or something like that, let me know. Um, or if there's mistakes in the projects, things like that. All these things do happen. So anyway, for today, I just want to have an introductory lecture sort of to orient people about Bitcoins and cryptography. And then next week, I'll start doing the chapters in the book, which are, you know, the sort of mathematical cryptography stuff. We are not going to go heavily into the math in this course. We're not going to do any proofs or anything. This is an engineering class, really. I'm not going into the theory of cryptography very much. I'm mostly interested in just how to use it, how to use it correctly. 
So we're just learning how to fill in the right parameters and get the job done. We're not talking about how to design a brand new cryptography or no proofs, no heavy math. Um, I'm not really interested in the math part. That would be another thing. Um, this is using it, engineering. Uh, the thing that motivated me to do this is I started looking at Android app security and a ton of Android apps do cryptography wrong and that's horrifying. So I think people in the business should know how to should understand cryptography enough to see if they did the right thing or if they did the wrong thing. Yeah, most of my students are not interested in math and they aren't ready to do math and you don't really need to do much math. The math doesn't get any more than a little algebra. We're just learning how to use it. We're not using going into the depths of the math. All right, so let me bring up the uh, slides for this Bitcoin stuff. I updated it a bit, although most of it was okay. There we are. All right, so let's talk about this. And we go to the start. And all right, there we go. And let me see if I can fit it on the screen reasonably well. Like I can get rid of that. And I can do that. Yeah, that's pretty good. All right. So, um, Attack of the 50 Foot Blockchain by David Girard is wonderful. I highly recommend it. Uh, you, As I mentioned, I am a Bitcoin bear. I do not think it's a wise investment. I don't think it's a good thing for society. And David Girard is the same. I like him. He has the same negative attitude about cryptocurrency that I do. And he's very good at writing. He wrote a couple books about it. And he gave a guest lecture in my class last time. I think I'll ask him to see if he wants to come back and do it again. He's a very knowledgeable guy from, from Britain. And anyway, some of the stuff in here came from that book. Some of it came from this book, Digital Gold, and a lot came from the website. Anyway, um, so a blockchain is the heart of all this. Bitcoin exists because of blockchains. And this is because there was a bunch of people um, through the late 90s and the early 2000s that were trying to invent some kind of money that would live on the internet. And there were a bunch of attempts to do it that didn't really work very well. And Bitcoin was the one that really worked, the best uh, version of money on the internet. So there's this thing to understand the blockchain in two minutes, which is really nice. One of my students pointed this out to me. Yeah, so I'm just going to play this two minute video. And I'll post the link in the chat in case anybody wants to just play it locally instead of through uh, Twitch. I don't know how well the sound and everything is going to go, but I think it works all right. And this is a very interesting video in a variety of ways. Have you ever wondered whether your ballot is actually counted? If you meet someone online, how do you know they're who they say they are? When you buy coffee that's labeled fair trade, what makes you so certain of its origin? To be sure, really sure, about any of those questions, you'd need a system where records could be stored, facts could be verified by anyone, and security is guaranteed. That way, no one could cheat the system by editing records, because everyone using the system would be watching. Systems like this are on the horizon, and the software that powers them is called a blockchain. Blockchains store information across a network of personal computers, making them not just decentralized, but distributed. This means no central company or person owns the system, yet everyone can use it and help run it. This is important because it means it's difficult for any one person to take down the network or corrupt it. The people who run the system use their computer to hold bundles of records submitted by others, known as blocks, in a chronological chain. The blockchain uses a form of math called cryptography to ensure that records can't be counterfeited or changed by anyone else. You've probably heard of the blockchain's first killer app, a form of digital cash called Bitcoin that you can send to anyone, even a complete stranger. Bitcoin is different from credit cards, PayPal, or other ways to send money because there isn't a bank or financial middleman involved. Instead, people from all over the world help move the digital money by validating others' Bitcoin transactions with their personal computers, earning a small fee in the process. Bitcoin uses the blockchain by tracking records of ownership over this digital cash, so only one person can be the owner at a time and the cash can't be spent twice, like counterfeit money in the physical world can. But Bitcoin is just the beginning for blockchains. In the future, blockchains that manage and verify online data could enable us to launch companies that are entirely run by algorithms, making self-driving cars safer, help us protect our online identities, and even track the billions of devices on the Internet of Things. These innovations will change our lives forever, and it's all just beginning. 
All right. I really like this video because not only does it summarize the truth about blockchain pretty well, it also summarizes the lies. Everything she said was a lie or an exaggeration. You might notice the first thing they say is it will hide your identity, and then they say it will mean you know who you're talking to, and a blockchain is going to drive your car. I'd be interested to see that. And a blockchain doesn't have a fee for transmitting. The Bitcoin transaction fee is currently about $30, and all those people do make fees by transmitting. It is just amazing how it is full of complete lies and complete exaggerations, and um, that is the main thing about cryptocurrency. It's almost all scams, and it's almost all people exaggerating how good it is to try to get you to invest. It's all a scam to get you to invest in something, then it will crash, then they run away with your money and say, gee, I couldn't see it was going to crash, and they start another one, and on it goes. So this is why 99% of everybody involved in blockchain and cryptocurrency says, it's wonderful, it's going to save the world, everything's great about it, you should buy now. They're all trying to sell it to you to get your money. The reality is, it is not, yeah, it's a Ponzi scheme. It only works when more people are buying in and in and in. As soon as people finally figure out that it's garbage and start selling, it will crash. Anyway, right now it's rising. And, well, that's what something a lot of people say. Less of a scam than the U.S. dollar. And that is a very interesting issue. I think that is emphatically not true, but I used to be in the system. The reason why the U.S. dollar is reliable is because we have laws and financial requirements and the um, Federal Reserve backing it up and the government and lawsuits and everything and auditing companies and all that ponderous bureaucracy is what makes the U.S. dollar stable and valuable. And Bitcoin is the dollar with the government out of it. Um, some Bitcoin is literally a Ponzi scheme. The rest of it argues that it is not. I would say it is, but it has not been prosecuted as a Ponzi scheme. Um, but I think the law is pretty much struggling at what to think about uh, Bitcoin. And certainly a lot of people love it. A lot of people think it's going to save the world and everything. And now there is no turning back. Because of Elon Musk, Bitcoin is here to stay. It's taken seriously. Serious banks are getting involved. Nations are getting involved. I don't like it. There's a lot of things I don't like that people do. They're doing it anyway. So uh, whether, for better or worse, we are moving into blockchains and cryptocurrencies now. So it's out there. So you should understand it and figure out what part of it you want to participate in. So let's take a look at the live on chain, live blockchain demo, which is blockchain 10 on my 141 page. Um, there, this one here. All right. Oh, that's bad. Maybe he took it down. Oh, good. Here's a block. There's the blockchain. Okay, good. Looks like one thing didn't work. But anyway, all right. So uh, let's play with his blockchain demo. So here it is. If I go to the blockchain, which is here, this is doing a simple little blockchain right in the browser. So I can have data here, like Sam has 10 coins. And when you put data in, it turns red because it hasn't been mined. And it hasn't been mined because the hash is down here. The hash is this random looking number starting with D. And um, when you mine it, it's going to change this nonce. This nonce is a random value. It's going to just keep trying random values until it gets a hash that starts with a lot of zeros. There it did. Now it's been mined. It turned green. The hash starts with a number of zeros. That's why uh, Jerry Gerard describes this as a lottery, which is the best way to describe it. I, the most common description I see is solving a difficult mathematical problem, and that's not what it is at all. You guess random numbers for the nonce until by chance you get a cash starting with zeros. So it's basically like just buying lottery tickets until you find a winning lottery ticket. Uh, just completely arbitrary, right? We need to start with zeros. They just needed, the point is to make you do a whole lot of work to find it. That's why it's incredibly wasteful. You, you have to do a lot of extra calculation just to do this, and the reason is they don't want it to be easy for people to forge these signatures. So all the miners in the world compete, trying, hash, trying changing the nonce until they can get the hash, and they arrange it to be so difficult by making the number of zeros very large that the fastest computers in the world will still take 10 minutes altogether to solve it. And whoever gets it first 
they publish their solution and other miners validate that they're correct and then they get a reward they get some bitcoins as a reward so they make money that's how miners make money and they adjust the difficulty to match the speed of all the miners put together how's the nonce different from password a password has a value and you would repeat that value later to log in the nonce here is just a random number and once this block is mined it's all over this block will never be mined again and you go on to the next one so it's really just random that's the difference you know password is something that's remembered and then you enter it again later and see if it's right the process though of hashing the block is very much like the hashing that goes on to make a password hash so this block has been mined so now the next block might say sam sends joe two coins and if joe mines this one joe gets 10 more coins every time you mine it see if sam mined this one he would get a reward like 10 coins if joe's the first person to mine this one he'll get 10 coins what is hashed is all this data including the nonce and including the previous hash this hash value goes here so when this one is mined it takes all this data plus the nonce plus the previous hash and that gets hashed here so if this block if you calculate the hash and it's right that means the whole chain is correct up to this point that's the point of the blockchain it is a lot of work to mine a block thousands of hours of supercomputer to get here so it's hard to calculate the blocks but once you've calculated them it is fast and easy to verify it this is called a Merkle tree it's a data structure developed long ago by a computer scientist named Merkle where it's very easy to verify that the data is intact yeah that's why it's pretty cool and so now over here if I say um, if Sam mines this one and gets 10 more coins 10 coins and Joe sends Sue five coins and then somebody mines this one now you've got a, a blockchain and now if anybody tries to change anything like sam tries to change this to 11 coins then they're all broken none of them work so uh, it, every block has to be intact or this hash will not match so this is the merkle tree this is the brilliance of the merkle tree design you you have blocks you hash the blocks and then you take the hash of this block and include it in the next block and you take the hash of this block and include it in the next block so the result is you can verify the integrity of the entire chain by just looking at the last block if this hash matches that value then you know that nothing has been changed anything changed back here will break the chain any one of these blocks that's different will cause this one to be wrong that's the trick yeah yeah it's a simple trick but it works and that's why you can have a wallet on your phone that's not very powerful and it can verify the blockchain but to mine the blockchain you have to have a big set of computers with a lot of power and all that jazz so this is how the blockchain works and the blockchain is by the way perfectly fine i have nothing against it it's a perfectly fine mathematical structure that has some desirable properties uh, there are actually no known applications of blockchain that are worth a damn but in principle it might there might be some useful purpose for it how does a node in the chain get modified well it wouldn't get modified but the point is if people wanted to try to cheat if i wanted to cheat and get more money and i was a miner i could try publishing a different blockchain with a different value here that's what you do and so the point is if i was able to mine faster than other people and i could get a couple of blocks ahead i could go back and change the data to be wrong and sell my wrong story and then i could print money and keep it that's basically the 51 percent attack if you control 51 percent of all the mining you can actually forge the blockchain uh, they're not the only danger but that's one of the dangers but if, if that's why you need it to be distributed like that video said what you want is a lot of independent people to be doing mining that do not conspire together to lie if a consortium of miners adding up to 51 percent of all the mining power were to conspire together they could forge the blockchain and they could lock everybody else out because they would mine a block but not publish it and mine the next block and then publish this one so everybody wastes their time trying to mine the next one that they've already mined and they'll release this one before they finish and they can make everybody else keep running and just sort of winning every race ahead of them and get all the money and they can even alter the con the contents of these transactions and even ones in the past 
So all the money that should go to other people goes to them and get away with it. So that's, um, it's, this is uh, called the Byzantine general problem. What do you do if some of the people in your group are betraying you and trying to cheat? How can you make a system where some number of people can cheat? And in general, the mathematics, the computer science, is it that you can only withstand up to about one third of the people in your group cheating if they work carefully together. In this case, it looks like you can withstand up to about half the people cheating in this simple case. But yeah, that's the issue. That's called the consensus protocol, exactly. There has to be some way for the miners to achieve consensus so that even if some of them are crooks and lying and cheating, the rest can somehow detect that. And in practice, this has worked pretty well, even holding an awful lot of money for Bitcoin. So these are very good, good questions I see people raising in the chat. All right, so that's the live blockchain. That's, of course, the Bitcoin blockchain is a little bit more complicated, but that's the fundamental way it works. So Bitcoin. Um, Bitcoin itself, to invest in Bitcoin, is just kind of risky investment. Um, almost all the uh, exchanges are crooked, lying about the price, manipulating it. Almost all the companies issuing coins are crooks. And, you know, you mostly lose your money when you invest in it. Now, if you were to buy some Bitcoin and just hold it, it would go up sort of for a while with a lot of ups and downs. Um, but I don't know how much longer it's going to go up because I don't know why it ever went up at all. Anyway, it's a high risk investment. The only actual clear value of Bitcoin is money laundering. That's why it exists. You can spend money and you can to some extent hide from your government what you're doing with it. So you can do tax evasion and um, you can do things that your government doesn't want you doing, like buying drugs and guns and prostitution and murder for hire and things like that with it to some extent. That's why it has value to commit crime. Anyway, yep. And so anyway, um, when I first found, learned about Bitcoin in 2015, I told people to this, to teach your kids about Bitcoin, give them piggy banks, six months later, smash them, steal the money and laugh. Then they'll understand what they need to know about Bitcoin. Because that's the experience everybody had at that time. And uh, then I, years later, I learned more about cryptocurrency, and now I hate them even more. But anyway, what's my opinion about Monero and other privacy coins? Uh, Monero and privacy coins are technically more perfect to hide your identity than Bitcoin, and therefore they are more effective at money laundering and crime, which is, so I'd say Monero is a technical improvement at achieving what Bitcoin is really for, which is money laundering, and popular for that reason. Anyway, so... Um, so here's the, the killer. This is why Bitcoin has any value. Money laundering. Silk Road was the original killer app. You could buy illegal things on the internet with Bitcoin. Then ransomware, of course, came out. And you pay in Bitcoin. And then there are a bunch of places where you have to do other kinds of money laundering, like in Argentina, at least a few years ago, and I don't think it's gotten any better. Their currency is horrible. The inflation rate is thousands of percent per year. And they made it illegal to put your money in anything but the official currency. So you illegally put it in Bitcoin to hide it from the government. And then your money lasts longer. So that's a form of money laundering. You're doing something with your money that your local government doesn't want you doing. And that's the point. Bitcoin gives you privacy, if you like. You can do something without people being able to find out what you did, like the cops and your government, so that if they don't like what you did, you have a chance of getting away with it. Now, recently, though, since 2017, it's been just speculation. People buy Bitcoin because other people are buying it. That's all, which is kind of nuts. But yeah, Mon McAfee, Monero. Oh, I didn't know McAfee was into Monero, but I know McAfee was into all of them. Yeah. Anyway, so this is, I thought it's funny, a lot of people say like, gee, I wish I'd bought Bitcoin like six or seven years ago, then I'd be rich. And David Gerard had a good answer. You know, if you'd bought Bitcoin six or seven years ago, you would have had it stolen at Mt. Gox. That's what would have happened to you. <laughs> That's what did happen. They lost 7% of all the Bitcoins in the world. It was the first exchange where a normal, non-technical person could buy Bitcoin. You would send them money. They would put your Bitcoin in their account. They would hold the private key. There's a private key to your Bitcoin. If you make your own, if you hold the private key yourself and keep it offline, like on a thumb drive or something, then nobody can steal your Bitcoin unless you make mistakes and don't choose a really random enough private key. But then if you lose the thumb drive, it's just gone. So most people don't understand that and they don't want that responsibility. So they go to exchanges like Coinbase is the new one, which is a lot better. The first one was Mt. Gox. You could buy your Bitcoin there and they would hold it for you. And that's fine, except they didn't secure it well enough and it all got stolen. So, or they lied to people and just embezzled it all. You never know which one of those happened. But anyway, the people that put their money there, it vanished. <laughs> anyway, and there's a, quite a story about it. So on it goes. By the way, this is so shady 
this guy, this exchange, the name of the exchange, Mt. Gox, was not, had nothing to do with Bitcoin. It was Magic the Gathering Online Exchange. He originally traded Magic the Gathering cards for that game. And when he decided to go into cryptocurrency, he was so broke he couldn't even buy a new domain name. So he made Mt. Gox as the Bitcoin exchange. But then he had a lot of money, but then it all vanished somehow. Anyway, yeah, that's what he did. So uh, anyway, so here's Bitcoin. Bitcoin started around 2013 and it was of zero value. Nobody cared except a few people just playing with it to see the mathematics and continued to have nobody care until they brought out Silk Road and you could start buying criminal things with Bitcoin and then it went up. And then in to, uh, around here, I think it's a bump you can hardly see down here. Then, then in 2017, there was a huge rush. This is when I taught this class one time and everybody was diving into Bitcoin like crazy because it was going up really fast. Then it crashed and stayed down for a really long time. And now again, it's gone up and now it's crashing down again. Um, so this is now the thing that is bad about this is there is no real reason for any of this because Bitcoin has no intrinsic value at all. And there's nothing you can do with a Bitcoin that you couldn't do just as well with a Visa card or a checking account, um, except uh, crime. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, Silk Road goes to China. That's a good one. <laughs> anyway, so um, China, by the way, kicked out all the miners and banned cryptocurrency there because they're going to make an official government cryptocurrency for the obvious reason, so they can track all the transactions themselves because in China they are very interested in tracking and controlling their citizens far more than America. And if they ran their own official government cryptocurrency, they would have the records of everything. <laughs> At least that's what most people think why they're doing it. So here's an editorial from a few years ago talking about the Bitcoin bubble. Um, Bitcoin is like a lot of things. People say it's great, but when you press them, they can't explain why it's great or what it's good for. There are supposedly four things that Bitcoin is good for. Um, one is a good investment. It rose incredibly fast in 2017. This is the dot-com bubble, how many days after it started. And here's the Bitcoin bubble rising much, much faster. Bitcoin, in fact, runs, rose as fast as tulips. In 1637, they had never seen tulips in, I think, Holland. And somebody brought over some tulips and people started buying them. And then people started reselling and paying more and more for them until they were paying the equivalent of like many millions of dollars for a single tulip bulb in just... Um, a few months, it rose from a reasonable price to an insanely rich price. And then, of course, everybody looked around and said, what are we doing? We're paying a million dollars for a stupid tulip bulb. And it crashed down to zero. And that was the end of it. And all those people lost money. And I think what you have here is a measure of how fast human stupidity goes. This is how fast people can just bid something up to a price that makes no sense at all. And that's exactly following the path of Bitcoin in 2017. Everybody was buying it just because it was going up. The same thing, by the way, just happened with GameStop and other companies. People all started buying something that wasn't worth much of anything. And it started going up and more people started buying it because it was going up. So it goes up and up and up for a while. And then, of course, it all crashes when everybody says, why are we paying this ridiculous price that's 100 times what this thing is worth? I'm going to sell and get my money. And what happens is the first couple of people that sell, they get their money. But then it crashes and all the rest of them lose money. It is how pyramid schemes work, too. All right. Anyway, so there's various um, bubbles. This has happened frequently, famous asset bubbles, and uh, Bitcoin was just another one. So I like this, this part of my life. This is the part called being stupid, buying something just because it's going up when the price is already really higher than it's worth. But that's what speculation is. So um, the fundamental problem with Bitcoin is the design. If you look at the blockchain, the whole point of the blockchain is miners are mining like crazy, trying to mine those blocks. They are doing millions of times more calculation than they required to just keep track of the blocks. If you take like Bank of America, they just have a central server with a database. When you spend money, they just change the number in a database. But in Bitcoin, all these miners have to do millions of calculations to mine that block to ultimately record the same thing. You spent some of your money. All that extra verification is incredibly wasteful. So it's a way to make computers a million times slower or a million times more expensive. Now they have to do tons of calculations just to record one transaction that somebody spent some money. Um, people can do things like shorting Bitcoin. They can. There are people that bet on Bitcoin futures. Yes, you can do that. You can, I don't think there are any official exchanges in America that will let you do it, although there might be. But there certainly are overseas exchanges that will let you do it. 
Anyway, because of that, Bitcoin runs very slowly, three to four transactions per second, which is terrible. Visa runs at 2,000 transactions per second, and PayPal is up at 200. Ethereum is a little better, but the Ethereum blockchain can't handle real traffic. There was a big project called CryptoKitties. I still have some of them, actually. It might be worth something. You have CryptoKitties, you buy these little cartoon kitties, and then you could resell them. And they went up like crazy. And just like all major Ethereum projects, it be looked cool. It started to become popular. And as soon as it became popular, the blockchain froze up and you couldn't sell them or move them anymore because they can't handle enough transactions per second to move anything at scale. So all that happens is you can make a prototype project. You can get an early version of it running. You can do a demonstration saying this is cool and collect a lot of investors. And when you try to actually roll it out, it crashes and fails. And then you say, gee, who could have seen that coming? And you keep the money and start another one. That's how it works. None of these blockchains can actually handle enough transactions to do anything at scale. Although there are some new ones that claim they're addressing that problem and some patches on Bitcoin like the Lightning Network that claim they're addressing that problem by basically going back to a non-blockchain centralized storage, which is how Visa does it. <laughs> so um, isn't this something better computing may solve? We will see. Anyway, a lot of people are developing many things and a whole lot of brilliant mathematics is being done here and cryptography. So um, it's, but anyway, here's the, one of the fundamental problems. So is Bitcoin a means of exchange? They've often tried to say you'll buy things at Bitcoin, like uh, a Central American country just decided they're going to make Bitcoin their official currency, Venezuela or something. And the problem is every Bitcoin transaction has a transaction fee of 25 or $30 now. That will never work. And it also takes an hour to perform a transaction. You can't use that stuff to sell a cup of coffee. <laughs> but they're just ignoring that and pretending it's going to work. And of course, Ecuador, yeah. And of course, most of their citizens don't understand any of this. They don't really have computers and phones. Yeah, El Salvador, maybe one of the, and like, what the hell? <laughs> you can't really use it as, but anyway, uh, so your point, it turns out that um, Bitcoin, the number of actual transactions performed in Bitcoin is extremely small. People do not buy things with Bitcoin. Um, so it's very, very rare. They buy things with things like Visa. Is it a store of value? People say, oh, you put your money in Bitcoin, it'll be safe. Well, it has been rising, but it doesn't isn't safe in the normal sense of investments because it has a high variation. The risk of investment is the variation over the mean. And Bitcoin crashes like crazy. Every quarter, it crashes by 25 or 50 percent. So that is not considered a stable investment. The typical store of value is gold. This is what my father told me 60 years ago. It's been true for centuries. People say, if you're worried about the government collapsing or something, buy gold. Gold will always be worth something no matter what happens. So, yeah, fleeing Venezuela. Yes. Oh, yes. That's one good thing. That's one reason why uh, countries with miserable local currency like Bitcoin, the good thing about Bitcoin is that you escape government restrictions, like you can move it to another country quite easily. Um, that's the point. Yeah, Bitcoin is like gold. Yeah, yeah, that's the point. People try to say Bitcoin is like gold, but this is gold from 1996 to 2016. The point is, it doesn't really change much. It goes up a little, comes down a little, but if you put your money in gold, then 10 years later, you pretty much got your money. Whereas if you put it in something like Bitcoin or Tesla stock or something, it might very well be worth nothing if that company crashes. That's the point. Oh, people, that's a very good question. Why is gold valuable? But it is something about the human race. We have considered gold valuable for millennia. So in general, you know, you, um, well, yeah, yeah. Anyway, that the standard store of value is gold and Bitcoin is not as stable as gold at all. So as a store of value, it really doesn't pass the test. And then there's initial coin offerings, which are a way to print your own money as a company. Um, these things were almost all completely scam. Um, you'd have initial coin offering, then it would crash. And I don't know if people are even still doing these. I haven't heard of an initial coin offering in the last year or so. For a while, everybody would do this. You would make a new, uh, a new uh, coin and sell it to, to instead of like stock for your company. And they seem to have gone out of favor. Now it's NFTs, which are even more bogus. Anyway, um, so here's Tether. Here's one of the incredible things about Bitcoin. The reason Bitcoin price has gone up is because people buy it with fake money. There's this monopoly money stuff called Tether created by the Bitfinex market, I think in uh, somewhere in Asia. And they made this thing called a stable coin, which is a total scam. What they have claimed is 
every tether is worth one dollar and we actually have a reserve of real dollars and we you could train your you could trade your tether in and get real dollars and we have an auditing company like pricewaterhouse cooper or someone that has audited and verified that we really have that now none of this has ever been true they started printing and using tether before they had any reserve at all they brought in a auditing company and they never actually had the, the funds and they strung them along for years until they quit and said as far as we can tell this is all bogus there are no funds um, and they're just printing and claiming to have this and this is what people actually buy bitcoin with is fake dollars and they run an exchange and every time the bitcoin price is falling they just print millions or billions more of fake dollars and buy it to prop it up this car market capitalization here is $62 billion of monopoly money, which is what's being actually used to prop up the price of Bitcoin. And this is what happens when you take the government out of your money. They're manipulating the price with fake dollars called Tether. And the actual cash reserve of Tether, they finally, after years of people screaming, they released a, a very misleading graphic, but David Gerard analyzed it. And Tether, the actual cash reserves are 3%. Now, this is why you can't do this with real money on a real bank in America. There's a reserve requirement. There are auditing requirements. There are financial regulations because we've been here before. In 1929, the banks did this. They would loan out all this money and they would invest it in highly risky things. And then they had only a tiny fraction of reserve. So when the prices, when the stock market crashed and everybody wanted to get the money out of the bank, the bank didn't have the cash. So they would line up waiting for their money and they've run out of money in there. They invested all their money foolishly and lost it. And that's what Tether is. Tether is all invested in crypto, <laughs> other crypto. So when the bubble bursts, that's why all the crypto people keep saying, buy, 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 never sell, never sell, hold, 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 because this only works as long as everybody keeps buying it. When people stop buying it and start selling it, we're all going to go broke because it'll start falling and when you go to trade your tether, they won't have the cash reserve. It will be gone. So you'll be sitting here with this account saying, I'm rich, I'm rich in Bitcoin, but but I can't turn it into dollars and the price is falling and the exchanges are all frozen. This has already happened several times. It happened with GameStop. It happened, uh, Coinbase froze up when Bitcoin fell earlier. It's happened a lot already. Yeah, who went, who keeps holding it? Everybody holds it. You exchange US dollars, yes. You buy, here's what you do. If you want to do like what students are asking questions, you want to bet on Bitcoin futures or something. Okay, if you, if you invest in Bitcoin in America with a reputable exchange like Coinbase, Coinbase in San Francisco is the most reputable Bitcoin exchange. They're trying to really obey the law and be serious. You can buy some Bitcoin and hold it and it might go up. But suppose that's not enough money for you. What you want to do is you want to buy on margin. I want to borrow money and buy Bitcoin for a margin of like 100 to 1. I'll put in like $1 and I'll borrow 100 more dollars and put all that in Bitcoin. And then if it goes up, I'll get rich, rich, rich. That's what happened in 1929. These people bought stock on margin. They would, they would have a normal job. They'd get a few bucks. They would borrow money and invest it all because the stock market was going up and up and up. And everybody said, we're fine. It'll just keep going up forever. And the point is, if there are, mar there are exchanges in foreign countries that will let you borrow and bid at 100 to 1 leverage. You can't do it in America. But what you do is you go to someplace like Coinbase and you turn your dollars into tethers. Then you take your tethers out of the country to an even less regulated foreign exchange where they will let you take incredible risks like 100 to 1 leverage. And then you can play really high stakes gambling. And that's why people put their money in Tether. But the point is, even if you win, all you're winning is more Tether. And is that Tether actually worth anything? And it's worth something right now. It's only worth something until people try to sell. When you actually try to turn it into dollars, you'll find out it's not actually worth anything. And that's what happened in 1929. Everybody thought they were rich because they had stocks. And the stocks meant a lot of money. But when they really needed the money, the stock market crashed and it wasn't there. That's why they call it a bubble. You, you think you're rich. You have this number, but if you actually try to like buy things, your money is not really there. Yeah, on top of printing fake tether, they're creating fake traffic. Yeah, you guys have got it. This is what happens when you have no regulations, no audit requirements, no federal reserve, no lawsuits. There's a reason why all that stuff was invented because of the disaster you get from unregulated banking. Anyway, so that's Bitcoin and the general cryptocurrency space. Then we should talk about Ethereum. Ethereum 
is invented to add a new feature to the blockchain. Yeah, you guys have got it. Creating bot traffic to make it look like you're important. So, smart contracts are the special feature of Ethereum. Ethereum moves from just being a store of a financial ledger to doing computations on the blockchain. So, you can have a program on the blockchain and you can have data on the blockchain and block by block it calculates new values of the data so you can do a algorithm on the blockchain. That's the point here. And the idea was you could make a smart contract which is a company that would run on the blockchain and it could take money and produce money and it would be run by a program on the blockchain so that it is not located in any nation, it is not run by any humans, and they hoped that they would escape all regulation this way. Like Bitcoin, they hoped to escape all financial regulation and taxes. Smart contracts were supposed to escape all laws and governments of every kind because they're not in any one country and they're not run by any people. So this was going to be the DAO. Ethereum was designed to do this, to let you run programs on the blockchain, and the poster child to demonstrate the value of this was the DAO, the Digital Autonomous Organization. This was the proof of concept. And the DAO would live on the Ethereum blockchain. People put in $150 million of investment in 2016. And there were problems noticed even before they launched it, but they ignored it. <coughs> and it ran for a month. And then a hacker stole half the money, $70 million, because there was a bug in the code. Now, the um, this was the DAO, and the, yes, yes, it didn't even last more than a month or so. Now, the point is, there was a flaw in the program. And by the way, the way the investment documents are written, they said it was, all the code was public on GitHub. And they said, here's how the DAO works. You can invest in the DAO, and the DAO will now loan out the money to people who have, like, uh, like Kickstarter campaigns. And you will propose something and people will vote on the blockchain who have invested. And if enough people vote, we will contribute money to you. And then you will pay interest and we'll all get rich. It was going to be an investment vehicle, uh, a sort of bank loaning money on the blockchain. And um, so they said, if you want to participate, you have to send money and buy some stake in the DAO. But you should be aware that there are two kinds of documentation of the DAO. There are readable PDFs and newspaper articles and stuff describing what it is. And then there is code on the blockchain code on GitHub. And they say, it is your responsibility as an investor to audit the code, because what you're really investing in is the code. And if you, it is possible that the PDF documents might be wrong, and we are not legally responsible if those are wrong. What you're really investing in is the code, and the code is what it really is. So what happened is, somebody saw a defect in the code, they ran the thing, they stole the money, and then they said, a black hat hacker stole the money. And he piped up on the blockchain, talking on it. He said, wait a minute, I'm not a hacker. I'm an investor. I invested in this. I saw it was in the code. I used the code as written. I want my money. I deserve my money. I'm just a smart investor. I'm not a criminal. I'm doing what you said. You are idiots that didn't read the code. That's not my problem. I want my money. And so Dow went to Ethereum and said, this is a disaster. We got hacked. You need to cancel the last month of transactions and start the entire Ethereum blockchain over, have a do-over on the investments. Now, Ethereum is like Amazon Web Services. If you buy an Amazon Web Service cloud computer, they say you can write code and run it on our machines, but we do not certify that your code will run as intended. Your code might crash. Your code might have defects. Your code might get hacked and lose money, and that's not our problem. All we do is run the infrastructure. All we tell you is we'll keep the server up and the power on and stuff. If you write crappy code and your code crashes, that is not our problem. And Ethereum tried to take that position. They say, dude, we're just running the blockchain. The blockchain is still running. The fact that you wrote this junk and got hacked is not our problem. And they tried to not roll it back. So the so-called white hat hackers came and stole all the rest of the money. The black hat hackers stole half the money, and the white hat hackers stole all the rest of the money in order to amplify the disaster, to create public relations that was so terrible, to pressure the Ethereum blockchain into rolling back, and they did roll back. So they rolled back the Ethereum blockchain to a month earlier to have a do-over. No, this is a very important question. This is a very common misconception. Isn't AWS supposed to guarantee security of the system? Absolutely not. All AWS guarantees is security in the sense that they will keep the machines running. 
They do not guarantee security of your software that you run on it, but many people think they do. Now you can pay for security products that they will offer you, but this is this was a survey that came out a few years ago that was great. Like 80% of people going to the cloud believed that the cloud provider was securing it, and the cloud providers are not securing it. So nobody's securing it. So that's why you got all these open Amazon buckets and everything else, cloud things that were set up ridiculously badly and getting hacked. Yes, unmanaged. I mean, well, what they do is they guarantee that they'll keep the power on and keep the disk running and keep the network connections going and stuff like that. They're selling the infrastructure. But the software you're putting on it is your responsibility, not theirs. And it's the same thing here. But they did pressure the DAO. The DAO did roll back. So now there are two DAOs, the old Ether and the new Ether, both running. Yeah, when you're creating security groups and authorization and such, I think Amazon certifies that those security groups will mean what they say they'll mean. But if you make mistakes in creating the security groups that lead to you getting hacked, I think that's your problem, not Amazon's problem. Although I'm not a lawyer and I, I'm just, just my opinion here. I don't necessarily know. You probably could argue in court an issue like that. But that's anyway. So now there are two forms of ether. The official ether, they say, is the one with the do over without the DAO hack. But what happened is all the miners moved to the new Ether that had the rollback. And therefore, the old Ether price fell to like 10% of its old price. But there were some miners that continued to mine on the old blockchain, even after the collapse of the DAO. And because the competition in mining got so low, it turned out to be more valuable to mine on the old blockchain than the new one. So both versions of Ether survived and went forward. And now there's just two cryptocurrencies. They have identical blockchains up to a certain point, and then they diverge. So anyway, that's, um, and then it forked again after that. So there's actually four living versions of Ether with slightly different blockchains, all being mined, all independently floating at different prices. And miners sometimes prefer to mine one and then the other, whichever one happens to be more profitable. So, um, uh, yeah, that's Ethereum Classic. I think Ethereum Classic is the one that had the DAO. I, I might get it wrong, though, but I think that was it. Yeah. Anyway, so um, here's he explained how he did it. There was a simple trick. We'll, we'll go through a hack very much like this, the way Ponzi coin got hacked. It's in the project. These smart contracts are written in a language called Solidity, and it is, in fact, a really miserable language where it's easy to make mistakes like this. Sort of like C is a miserable language to write operating systems in, and it keeps leading to security vulnerabilities. There are better languages like Rust, where you wouldn't have these problems, but uh, all these current smart contracts are being written in old-fashioned languages that have things like integer overflows and underflows and stuff like that, where it's pretty easy to lose control of the money. So Parity Technology was somebody that made the most secure way of interacting with the Ethereum network ever, except uh, not so much. It was the biggest hack in the world in 2017. They stole $156 million um, or froze it. They said they just destroyed it and froze it so nobody could spend it. And then uh, a few months ago, they started spending it. So it looks a little bit more like it was stolen than just frozen or destroyed. But anyway... Um, and then, of course, last week, the biggest hack in history again, $600 million stolen from the Poly Network, which is a blockchain network that lets you move from one blockchain to the other. You can trade Ethereum to Bitcoin and other things on one central network that spans across them. And um, But what's incredible to me is this hacker stole $600 million and then just gave it back. And, you know, people do things like play the lottery and invest, hoping to make, you know, $100,000 or a million dollars. Who in the world would get $600 million and say, okay, I'm just giving it back. Who needs it? Like, dude, if, if you wrote that in a comic book or a movie, I would say nobody would do that. I mean, nobody would have that kind of money and then just give it back. Like, what the hell? <laughs> but that's what they did. They just gave it back. So anyway, um, like I say, the reason I'm doing this instead of ignoring it is Elon Musk. Elon Musk put $1.5 billion of Tesla in um, cryptocurrency, I think Bitcoin and Dogecoin, and in fact, it held up his company. He didn't sell very many Teslas for a while. He was losing money on the Teslas, but he made money on crypto. So he managed to keep a good balance sheet and keep the Tesla company going. So, but the fact that a gigantic investor moved in like that, everybody said, well, I guess this stuff is legit now. And they all moved in too, like banks and everybody else. So it's part of our financial structure now, for better or worse. There are going to be jobs in it and jobs securing it and jobs responding to security incidents and developing new ones and all that jazz. So it's, an, it's something we all need to know about. So anyway, 
We've talked about the blockchain, the technology behind Bitcoin. All the miners have the complete ledger. So it's very difficult to cheat. So the idea is you, know, you can do exchanges without having anybody you trust in the middle, like a court or a government or a bank. That's the idea. He gave it back because he couldn't withdraw it. Yeah, that could be. Yeah, but I, I bet there would be another way around that. But anyway, all right. So, um, so there's a lot of jobs in crypto and blockchain. The postings are going up. Here's the last couple of years. So that's why I say you should be taking this class and others like it. You can get a job in this field. Um, so we talked about how it works, mining and such. Here's the transactions. You, know, you take in some money, you have an output. It's from Alice, signed by Alice. Some of the money goes to Bob. Some goes back to Alice as her change. That's what a transaction looks like in Bitcoin. The hashing algorithm is SHA-256 of SHA-256 of a block. And the hash had to start with 69 bits of zero in uh, 2017 when I wrote this slide. The difficulty may have changed by now. They adjusted every um, every week or so. They adjust the difficulty to keep the average time of a block 10 minutes. And a Bitcoin transaction is not considered irreversible until there are five blocks on top of it. That's why it takes 10 minutes before a transaction gets put on the blockchain and it takes one hour before it's considered irreversible. So if you buy a cup of coffee, in principle, you ought to sit there and wait an hour for it to clear before you get your coffee. But nobody does that. They just take the risk. Of course, nobody uses Bitcoin for those transactions anymore because the transaction fee is too high. Anyway, um, miners get an award. It originally was 50 Bitcoins, and every four years it halves, so it halved to 25. I think it recently halved down to 12 and a half Bitcoins. It's gradually going down to zero. And in the long run, uh, Bitcoin is supposed to be maintained by transaction fees. You choose the transaction fee. When you decide to spend money on Bitcoin, you say, I'm going to take my one Bitcoin and give half a Bitcoin to Bob, and then my change should be half a Bitcoin, but I'll make it 0.499 Bitcoins to leave a little extra as a tip. That's the transaction fee. And the miners don't have to include your transaction in the block. They can choose which transactions to put in a block which they mine. And they usually won't bother to mine your transaction if you don't give them a tip. So that's the transaction fee which is currently, like I say, uh, last I saw, it was up around $25 or so. You have to pay $25 or people won't mine your block, mine your transaction, and you can't really spend your Bitcoin. So Bitcoin proves that um, you can do this distributed ledger thing. It works uh, for better or worse. It hasn't crashed. It hasn't been seriously hacked. There are a few minor problems here and there, but the Bitcoin blockchain is still running and it hasn't had any big security disasters was invented by a fake person with a fake name, Satoshi Nakamoto, who invented and launched it and mined a ton of Bitcoins, enough to be worth, I think, trillions of dollars, and has never come out of hiding and never cashed any of his money. This person just vanished. Either they died or they just don't care at all, which is very strange. And it was a specific response to the 2008 financial crisis. Um, you can see that in the block. If you look at the Genesis block that starts the Bitcoin blockchain, it's right here. The whole blockchain is public and you can see it. And the Genesis block has, the block has a space where you can put a comment in the block. And here it is. This is the comment in the Genesis block. The Times, 3 Jan 2009, the London Times, Chancellor on break of second bailout for banks. The person who did this was sort of a libertarian. He said, I hate these bank bailouts and cash devaluing. I want to have a form of currency that no government can corrupt and control. And that was the point of Bitcoin. No government can decide to bail out the banks or change the value of it or anything. It's just out there like gold. It's a real thing, sort of, that nobody can control. And there were a lot of people, like the kind of people that wanted to go back to the gold standard, that felt like what we really needed was that kind of currency in the world. And they made it. So anyway, um, yeah, so that was his complaint. And Bitcoin is his response to that. And so now, for better or worse, we have Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. So uh, that's it for this one. I see a lot of good comments there. Um, and uh, so what you should do in this class is start doing projects. If you go here, there's a uh, schedule and various things are due. Um, these asterisks mean I'm not going to lose any points for being late, not until after the ad day. So you don't really have to do anything until September 8, but you might as well get started. And if you go up to the projects page, you'll find a lot of projects to do. And so if you want, if particularly focused on cryptocurrency, you'd do these. If you're going to do the normal stuff, you'd start down here. And so here it starts with binary games where you learn binary and then the Caesar cipher and such. 
So if you click on one of these, you have a project to do where you use download some software. This one you're using something called Cryptool and you use it to implement some cryptographic systems. And when you get them working, you will find a flag. So down here someplace is a flag. Yeah, 102.1. There we are. So you have to decrypt this paragraph and the author of that quote is here. And so when you find the author, that's the flag. So you take a screenshot of your screen creating that flag and you turn it in in Canvas. Um, and the uh, turn in procedure should be at the top of this page. Oh, I'll add them there. Pardon me. Um, I have them in my other course and I'll copy it over here. In fact, I'll probably do that in just a minute here if there aren't too many questions. Uh, the turn in instructions are this. Get the screen image with the flag, type the flag in the text field, and turn it in in Canvas so my grader can check it. That's what you have to do. I'm going to copy this block onto the crypto page. Anyway, you should start doing projects. And if any kind you like, if you want to do the uh, crypto projects, you start by MetaMask and Ethereum, and then uh, try some of these others. Meta is the mobile wallet. And then you can start making a smart contract in Ethereum. And uh, then you start hacking smart contracts and so on. Um, your projects have multiple flags. Yes. Um, yeah, the flags are separate. You can turn in a different, you turn in as many flags as you want. So, for example, this one 30 has got a series of flags. And so, yeah, you'll, you'll have, you turn them in several times. Yeah, put in several flags, label them. You know, like I found this flag, 102.1 was this flag, 102.2 was that flag, and you'll have a couple of images. So, you, you turn in multiple flags, uh, you'll turn in multiple images and type in multiple flags. Yeah, good. For Bitcoin transaction, May 18, 2010, Laszlo was offering 10 Bitcoins for two pizzas. That's right. Yeah, it took four days. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, back then it wasn't apparently worth anything. Anyway, um, so you can try those things out. I think I'm going to stop the recording.